see, before I get into uh, the PowerPoint, that uh, this is a brand new computer, by the way, and uh, the PowerPoint is just crashing it. So um, we've got to do it this way, so my apologies. Um, I'd like to um, give all of you a card. Um, and does anyone need a writing utensil? Because I have some extra pens up here. Anyone need a pen? OK, awesome. I'm just going to have them pass them backwards. So um, take one, take two. But um, what I would like to ask from you is that during the course of the talk, if there's a question that you'd like to ask me, I would love for you to write it down. And it can be about absolutely anything. It could be about something that you hear, that you see, um, some question you had in the back of your mind, if you want to know what I had for breakfast, like if I'm single, like whatever you want to ask. Like seriously, it's, it's all game. I want to be an open book for you guys because um, as John specified earlier, I am new here and um, I'd like to use this as an opportunity for the public to get to know me a little better than just, um, you know, what's been written about me or, and or you see uh, through my uh, engagements. So, um, this image was taken by David Moog. Uh, I know a few of you in the audience uh, have had your picture taken by him. If you're not familiar, he's doing this ongoing project at the Birchfield where his goal is to photograph every living artist. And by artist, that's not uh, encapsulated within a very specific realm. It incorporates every medium, everything. Even if the people have spent just a small amount of time in Western New York, he wants to get them you know, behind his camera. So um, he's really easy to access. You can just go to the Birchfield while it's open and have your photograph taken. So if you're sitting in the audience and you fall underneath that huge category, I suggest that you reach out to him. So, all right. Uh, so I don't want to have this be like super formal or anything, but I was having a conversation with a friend of mine on the West Coast that I've worked a lot with. and. He's like, Larry, you're doing a talk. He's like, what are you going to title it? And he's like, you should have it be something about your purple sneakers. And I was like, OK. Because uh, the funny thing was, I moved here uh, last November, uh, a few days before the big crazy storm that happened, mainly on the east and south side of Buffalo. But um, these were my winter boots when I moved here. <laughs> And uh, my boss, Jax DeLuca, at Squeaky Wheel was like, ah, Tina, you might want to think about getting something else on for your feet for the winter. I was like, oh, no, I'll be fine. You know, I can wear layers. Like, I'll be good. So um, in any case, so the title and sort of uh, background is kind of uh, incorporating that. So um, I was going to start kind of as close to the beginning, I guess, of my um, so this is a curated talk, literally. Um, I'm just talking about my role and projects where I've been in, in that position as a curator, quote unquote. Um, we could have a long discussion of what a curator is. Um, I feel like everyone in this room is a curator, like you curate your book collections, your music, your record, vinyl, you know tape collection, the food you eat, what you carry, have in your house, and so forth. But um, in terms of visual arts, <laughs> uh, I started as a, as a senior. Uh, this is a paper clipping from the um, local paper. Uh, I was getting a little bored. I was a painting and drawing major. And uh, a friend of mine was running this art nonprofit space in Iowa City. And she asked me if I wanted to put together a show. And um, uh, Elise, who's the woman in the middle, she really kind of helped me because I was getting bored with painting. And so she let me and taught me how to use her camera and I started taking photographs. And so that sort of uh, ended up evolving into the show that I curated in 2003. Um, and so that was my, my, my first, uh, you know, uh, actually my first show and curatorial uh, show. So I. I learned a lot at a young age. I was like uh, 24 in that picture. And then from undergrad, I had the, uh, the pleasure of getting a job, but it wasn't like a typical job. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the AmeriCorps VISTA program in the States, but 
It's, um, it's a, a federally funded program where it places recent undergrads into the nonprofit sector working in a range of, um, of business. Everything from the arts to healthcare to the environment. You can work up in Alaska or Missouri. Um, I ended up going to Rhode Island and working for AS20, which is, um, I would say, probably the largest art nonprofit in Providence. And I had the good fortune of working with this man. I don't know if any of you know him, but he is a legend in his own right. His name is Bert Cranko. And he is a force not to reckon with, um, as you could probably tell by his attire. I mean, this man, I still go back to Providence and visit him, and he still dresses, looks like this. And yeah, it was just an extremely memorable experience. Uh, and I was there only for a year um, as their assistant development director. I didn't do any sort of curatorial experience, but I learned a lot about how nonprofits function. I learned about grant writing, how to organize and execute events, very large scale of events. I learned about how to uh, acquire in-kind donations, corporate sponsorships. I learned about uh, uh, capital campaigns. I, I mean, this man started his organization decades ago with his wife out of a very small space. And they now have multiple buildings in downtown Providence. Uh, the whole sort of essence of the organization that really like that was, I don't know, just struck a core with me was about accessibility. Uh, they have multiple gallery spaces and, y and it's not curated. You just literally have to sign up and you'll have a show. I mean, maybe not tomorrow, maybe in a year, but you'll have that show. And they've, um, they have a lot of different types of youth programs um, with the different juvenile facilities in town. And they also have live work spaces that are below market value. They have residencies. So if you want to go and live in Providence, you can live in one of their buildings and work. And it was just a beautiful model coming after out of undergrad where all of the artists that we were exposed to were gallery artists. You know, they had one hat, they made one product, they, you know, sold their work in a gallery. And for me, like, that was never my stick, you know? Like, I always wanted something else for my art practice, and I, I made that commitment to myself at a very young age, and I've stuck with it. Uh, and then being able to work with this man, like, really kind of opened up, like, the plethora of, like, possibilities. And he really taught me that if you have an idea, you can make it happen. There's always ways of, of you know, of finding, you know, the, the path in order to make it happen. Uh, I... Uh, another talk of how I ended up in San Francisco, but I did. And um, I, after I got done working at an art nonprofit, running their youth arts program, I got involved with Intersection for the Arts. Um, they're in a little bit of disarray at this point in time, but they had a 40 year record and they did theater, they did visual arts, they had a fiscal sponsorship program, they had a literary series, a jazz series. They were all encompassing of all mediums and another wonderful institution for me to have experience with. Um, I sat on their board of directors for two years and ran their events and fundraising. Um, I expanded their patronage and the beautiful thing about this organization was the board and the staff weren't extremely separate. Like I went into the office and helped them on a day-to-day -day basis and their staff was amazing. And it was under the leadership of Deborah Cullen, who is now the um, CEO of Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, which is a very large, um, important, prominent uh, contemporary arts center in San Francisco. Uh, Kevin Chen was the visual arts programming director. And uh, Rebecca Rodriguez was their outreach and youth programmer. And Sean San Jose did their theater component. So. The staff had so much energy. Like the amount of programming they did, like they make every other organization be like, how could you possibly do that with such a small core staff? It, you know, they learned how to be efficient and use their resources wisely. And they had a great board where everyone gave something and contributed to this larger picture, which it was just an amazing experience. You know, not every organization has that luxury of having all the components 
working properly, you know? Like you think of every organization, wherever it is that you're working, you know, as a giant machine, you know? And it needs to be oiled, parts need to be fixed, you know? You need to feed it, you, you know? And, um, and, and while that crew was there, like they really knew how to work with what they had. Uh, let's see, so, <laughs> so we art space, that's, um, that's a long story in itself, but um, so I met my now ex-husband while I was uh, on the board at Intersection for the Arts, and I fell in love, and he was living in Oakland, and I was kind of getting bored at San Francisco at that time. I was there for four years, the gentrification was kind of just starting to you could start seeing it through the, the fixtures, and I wanted something new. I wanted a new landscape, and uh, we ended up moving in together into this space, which was, we had just had the first floor. Um, it was a live-work loft. Uh, it, it had previously been like an upholstery shop years ago. Um, it really wasn't that much space. We had a small loft on the top where like our closet and our bed was, but then we turned the whole first floor into literally a public art space. We had a dark room for photography where we would develop our film. Uh, I had a small office and studio. Uh, we built what you see in the front, these white walls so we can have a storefront gallery. On the back side was more gallery viewing space. Uh, that couch, this is um, actually taken uh, before the opening of a show with Chris Sollers. Um, this was back in 2010, and uh, Chris Sollers, it, uh, let's see, a year or two ago was a Guggenheim recipient uh, and is now a full-time faculty at Mills College in Oakland. And But uh, we had dozens of bands play in our living room. We... Um, had traveling chefs. I worked with overall like hundreds of different types of artists with exhibitions, everything from large group shows with like 20 to 30 people to solo and duo exhibitions. And anyone who had an idea, like I really wanted to make it happen. And one of the great things about Oakland was there's this really strong DIY sentiment there. And at this time, it was it was affordable, and people, you know, were taking over warehouse spaces, and they were just, you know, making their dreams a reality. Uh, we didn't really have, you know, much problem with the cops or anything, except for one exhibition, <laughs> which is kind of funny, actually. We, uh, I was working with this artist, uh, Joey Enos, who just got his uh, MFA from UC Berkeley, and. The title of his show was We Are All Gonna Die. And his work was uh, very much based on cartoons. And so he made these sculptures kind of based on these objects that you would see in these old cartoons, like, um, you know, like with Bugs Bunny and the Roadrunner and things. So it had that nature to it. So I was like, why don't you make this sign and we'll, you know, we'll like put it in this like, um, in the space and we'll just stand it up outside and then that way people will know that this is where the art show is happening. Well, my neighbors thought that we were a cult, so they called the cops and it wasn't like regular cops that showed up. They were like undercover, they were dressed really nicely and we're like, what's going on? And you know, people are outside smoking cigarettes and having a beer and uh, <laughs> And they were just like, we got a complaint about, you know, a possible cult happening. And I was like, I was like, well, um, this is an art show. I mean, some people may see art as kind of a cult. So I was like, or something more spiritual. And uh, we're, you know, I'm like, you're welcome to come in. No one's hurting themselves. There's no blood. Like, we're not, you know, killing cats right now. Like, we're just uh, enjoying the art that's on the walls and on the floor. So that was an interesting experience. Um, but I just have some uh, images from some of the shows. This was an installation. Uh, you can't really tell by the photo, but the backdrop where the clouds are um, is the sort of uh, boundary of our like uh, loft where we were sleeping. Like we really invited artists to come in and take over the space. Like we wanted everything about our space to be a part of the exhibit. Like we didn't want there to be a boundary. And um, 
any idea that they had, like we really wanted to be able to um, allow that to happen. Um, so here are some images from like the front um, window uh, storefront gallery, uh, some examples of some other programming. So uh, we knew so many different types of mu musicians and different types of performance artists. So. Uh, we would always have an opening and closing. All of our events were free. Uh, we got on this really great like underground indie rock circuit. So we would have musicians from Maine to Texas, Ohio, like all playing in our living room. Uh, we would never charge a, a door fee, but then we would have a jar that would be passed around for donations. So it would cover the band's um, you know gas and possible food expenses. Um, so the photo on the left is from an opening a performance of a, actually a local group. And then uh, with some of the artists, we, like with Joey, and that's actually kind of him in the forefront, his back is to us, but you know, his work was so heavily influenced by cartoons, so we invited him to curate a night of cartoons that informed his work. Um, <clears throat> and we also did different film screenings and such over the um, mainly like two years programming. And here is some documentation from uh, Chris Vogel, who is a local artist, not really well known, really quiet, but really talented. And so he <laughs> did these amazing line drawings in our house uh, with this like type of um, yarn that was colored. And um, as you can see on the right, like it really kind of inhibited our space so much. Um, you can't really tell by these photographs, but we had this small little ladder to get up to our loft where we slept. And it would have to, it was almost like you were in a, a, a crime movie or something, and you were like, you know, trying to steal that diamond, but there's the, um, you know, those lasers. And so you have to like train yourself of like how to get up and around without like, you know, having it set off an alarm. It was kind of like that every night and in the morning, like getting out of our loft. So, uh, but I mean, it was all about the art and it, and, for me, like it was worth making that sacrifice. Um, these are a couple of images. Uh, for a few years, we did this big show um, in the summer called Paint by Number. So we would have different artists. Uh, we would do an open call, and artists would make work based on that uh, theme. And then we would always have like a big show, and it was always on July 4th, so it was a big July 4th party. Uh, as you can see on the right, like. You know, a lot of people would come. We would do a sidewalk barbecue. Uh, the bus you see there would also have music that I programmed on it. So there'd be music happening on the bus as well as inside of the gallery for the whole day. And every year, you can see on the left, um, there's a mural that we projected. And we would do the outline of and then give everyone the paint so they would be able to sort of interact and have some other uh, contribution and connection to the show. And these images are from the last Paint by Number show we did in 2011. Um, this was a performance piece that happened out front. Um, so again, just kind of showing the different ways that we um, interacted with artists and gave artists opportunities, you know, based on um, on their ideas and uh, aspirations. Um, all right. So in 2011. <laughs> Uh, Naven and I both applied to grad school, and uh, I ended up starting the graduate program in the spring, technically, but was taking classes in the fall. So we shut down the gallery in terms of its programming because we weren't getting paid. Like, we actually had set it up as a for profit business so we could use all of our receipts of things that we had invested into the space as a tax write off. Um, but the money that we made through donations of, you know, the sale of alcohol and such um, helped feed back into the space to cover, you know, some of our overhead, like, you know, electricity and rent and such. <clears throat> and, you know, we actually, we sold artwork as well, which was always a nice bonus, but we gave the majority of the sales always to the artist. <clears throat> So from 2011 to 2012, that storefront part of the space that was in the other photos, I turned into like a rotating uh, installation space. So I would invite artists to have prolonged exhibitions in that space because 
one thing you noticed from the first photograph was that we were kind of on a major point like of intersection. There was a bus stop right there. We're actually just two blocks away from BART, which is like our subway system. And um, it was a very active, um, an active corner. And I felt like after we had closed the space that I was doing a disservice to the community. You know, just by having these blank white walls when I knew all these artists that could easily do something and activate that space. Um, so from 11 to 12, there was always artist installations in that space. But um, the decision to go to grad school, um, I felt like I had, I kept giving myself to the community and to everyone else. So. While I was running We Art Space, I was also running the largest uh, reoccurring art event in the States called the Oakland Art Murmur. Every art walk in the country is pretty much based off of this organization that I turned into an art nonprofit and I was its first executive director of. So I was doing We Art Space, I was doing Oakland Art Murmur, and I also had my own visual art practice and had a studio that I, um, off-site and had solo shows and group shows that I was doing. And I really just wanted time for myself. And I, and I know there's a bunch of you out there that are in grad school right now or, you know, that have gone to grad school, so you kind of understand that need. Um, so, but <laughs> while I was in grad school, I wasn't satisfied enough. So uh, I turned one of the walls in my studio into a rotating gallery. And I invited artists that were not a part of the grad school to come and do an installation or to give me their work. And I would do an installation with it uh, just to activate this space. Because when you're in grad school, you don't necessarily have enough time to be active in the outside world community. And I thought it was really important for there to be a crossover. And um, so I uh, did this for the last year of my grad school. Um, and it was wonderful. Um, oops. Um, because there was visiting artists and curators that were coming through my space to do studio visits, and yet I was giving these people exposures. I would have you know, an open door so anyone that wanted to come in and look at this work. And um, so I, I, for me, it was like I, I felt like I was doing something other than just working on myself, which is something I realized in grad school was really important to me, this idea of selflessness. Uh, Vernissage was our uh, senior thesis show, and every year up to our year um, in 2014, the San Francisco Art Institute has rented another space off-site of campus for artists to do their final installations or show their final body of work to the public, and it was open over the course of a few days. Well, uh, being the person that I am, I curated four local artists, uh, into the show. Uh, one, because the weekend that our show was opening was also the weekend of the big art fairs in San Francisco. And so I invited four artists that were not represented by galleries whose work I loved and who are people that I really believe in as artists. And I curated them into different spaces. I knew, I ended up we got to choose a space, or we could put our top three spaces of what we wanted in this building, and the building that we were in was in an old, um, uh, in the old Federal Mint, so an old house structure, in that house, but you know, it was a housing structure in a sense for money. And um, I chose the bathrooms and the areas underneath the stairs as you're going into the basement where the vaults were. Um, and this artist is uh, Elizabeth Kane, and, um, and she obviously did the site-specific installation. And the people who run this space are turning this building now into a museum for the city of San Francisco. They loved her work so much that they asked that the mu uh, mural pieces that are on the doors and things be kept up. Um, the image on the left is the work by Eric Parra. And on the right is Scott Greenwald. And then I had Karen Thomas um, do the men's bathroom because she makes this really provocative work of women. And the best thing about this was um, the opening night for like the VIP reception um, isn't necessarily open to the public. You know, you have to buy an expensive ticket and such. But uh, it was wonderful because I was doing curatorial talks and walks with the people that were there. And I was like, oh, I was like, come into the last space that I've curated. 
And they're like, are we going into the men's bathroom? And I was like, yeah, do you have a problem with that? <laughs> so I would just knock and we would walk in. And so it was like this exciting kind of revelation for them that uh, the space that normally would be overlooked was being activated. And I had her make these small drawings, as you can see, that were hung up all over the bathroom, um, over the toilets and the urinals. So no matter where a man was looking, he, his eyes uh, were looking at these feminine uh, bodies. Uh, so let's see. Um, uh, so I graduated from SFAI in May of 2014. Um, to bring us up to speed quickly, I got into a postgraduate program on full fellowship in Los Angeles. And so I moved down there, I was there about a month, and then I had a family emergency back here. I grew up in central New York, so I had to come back east. And um, as it worked out, I couldn't necessarily go back because of the situation, so I have a um, couple cousins, family, that live in Buffalo. I've been coming out here since 2010, visiting and, and watching and uh, you know observing and seeing Buffalo really um, you know, go from a, a, a place of you know plight to a place of prospect, and I think it's about the people that are here and the timing and the ideas, and um, I really felt it was a good time to move here because I saw <clears throat> that there was room for growth and opportunity. Uh, so I actually. Um, Last weekend would have marked my one year anniversary visit of Buffalo. I came up for curtain up because um, my cousin, uh, David Mitchell, is the artistic director of SEPA. And I came up, he's like, we have this great show opening, you've gotta come see it. And I was like, okay. And so I came up and, and I fell back in love with Buffalo. It reminded me of like the first time I'd been here in 2010 as an adult. And um, I just, I really, I just, I really loved what I saw and the energy of the people and how people here are so genuine. Like it's not a fakeness. It's like people are very real here and living in different parts of the country and doing a lot of traveling, like you don't have those qualities in other cities. Um, and I am I know some of you in the audience aren't from here, so you understand what I'm saying. Um, so in any case, um, I came up in September I fell in love, so between September and October, I was like, how am I gonna move here? How am I gonna make this happen? So I went back to central New York, and I came up with the concept of Project Grant. Uh, it's a international artist residency that's social practice based, which means it's, it engages with the community. So the artists that I bring here um, work with the sort of lower income neighborhoods and providing access to a creative outlet. Um, and so I had my first um, artist in residence this past June, but when I first moved here, I did this um, project at uh, Big Orbit that maybe some of you attended, and it was called San Fran Buff Nonstop. And I wanted to introduce artists living on the West Coast to Buffalo. And so I curated, um, this is all work that if you ever get invited or have the opportunity of seeing, it's in my home. Um, but I installed it there. I set up a bar, as you can see on the left, where I was able, I think Janine, that's you actually. Oh, she just, isn't that Janine, isn't that you? That's where we first met. I'm just trying to come in right now. I'm just going to have to do Oh. Yeah, that was the first time that we met. So I did this performance where I was this bartender and I got Lock House Distillery to donate a bo uh, two bottles of alcohol so I could make cocktails for people. Well, unknowingly, I didn't know about Buffalo that everyone that lives here knows exactly where the bar is in every place they walk into. So people just bypassed me. People didn't even know I existed. Like people were walking right past me being like, what are you doing? And I'm, I'm like, don't you see the sign? It says bar. Like. And it's free, but um, in any case, I had a few local musicians uh, performing during the opening, and it, for me, it was just a really great way of like introducing myself to Buffalo and saying, hi, I'm Tina, I'm here. Um, in the spring, every month, starting in February, 
um, I did this um, program called Arts Talk, and I invited artists uh, from the community to come and talk about projects that they were um, working on and that they wanted some critical feedback on. Um, and I provided this sort of informal space of my house. There was a potluck. I usually made soup or chili or something, and people brought snacks and something to drink. And um, I'll just, uh, this is Tommy Nugent on the left in the red. Um, he made this uh, cake, and he was trying this this process out for one of his performances. Um, so it was sort of like the first run. And on the right are a couple different masks that he made. He was um, he he just graduated from UB, and unfortunately lost him to New York City. But he has close contacts here, so he hasn't gone too far. Um, and also on the right, I just want to point out, I believe that's. David, right? And uh, David was my first intern at Project Grant. He was a UB um, undergrad in the art history department. Thanks, David. <laughs> and also during the spring, I did this private event called the Dinner Party. So I um, did a hatch fund campaign, which is kind of like Kickstarter, but it's geared towards just art projects. And I raised some money to kind of help me get started here in Buffalo. And as a way for me to thank the patrons, I curated this dinner with four guests. They didn't know who they were. Um, and I would prepare a meal for them, which based on questions I had asked them, um, and I would have drinks that were relevant to the dinner um, and to their liking. And um, I will never, you know, say who was at what dinner, you know, per se, but um, I took some images like before and after of the meal um, as a, a, a way just for me to um, document the event, but to keep the people anonymous, because I felt like that was always really important, because I wanted people just to be able to be themselves and interact with others um, in this private, safe place. And then June came, and that's when my residency started off. Um, I worked with three artists in the month of June, and we did free art classes in the Massachusetts Ave Park, um, which is located in the heart of the west side. Um, it's a very derelict park, but I was told that Push Buffalo is now taking over um, the maintenance of it, so hopefully the needles and the garbage and the pervs that hang out there will <laughs> will dissipate. Um, but I didn't ever, I, I mean, I did a Facebook event for people just so they know that this was what Project Grant was doing, but I wasn't really expecting any of those people to come. Like, it was about the kids that were going to be there at the park. Um, they were pretty much all um, low income and refugee or immigrant family youth that were there. And it was such a loving and like eye opening experience. Uh, for the month of June, like I pretty much had half the students every week were the same, or the other half were new and they had heard about it from someone else. And they just came willingly. And if you've ever worked with youth, you know that they have, you know, um, a, a certain expiration. <laughs> if you can keep their attention for longer than a half hour, like you're really doing something good. And the kids were there for like an hour, hour and 40. 15. Some kids were there for the whole two hours. Like, it was a really amazing experience. Like, these kids were just so hungry and they loved the attention, you know? And one of the kids is like, How much does this cost? And I was like, Well, it's free. He's like, What? <laughs> and I just, for me, that's just, that's so important. Um, so, Hope Mora was um, a recent, at the time, transplant from Texas who was looking uh, for opportunities to teach youth. Uh, Christine Heller is an artist from central New York who's done a lot of um, outreach um, and engagements through murals in different uh, neighborhoods around the state of New York and in Colorado. And I also hired uh, Jenna North, um, who's an artist and teaching uh, uh, professor at Munson Williams Pratt in Utica. And one of my uh, community partners for this year, the Buffalo Art Studios, donated their community space so I could exhibit all of the youth work. Um, Jenna and Christine were in, they came into town for the opening. But the one thing that I learned from this was um, these kids, they don't have agency. Like, I had made up, like, these little flyers every week I would give the kids to let them know, hey, your work is going to be shown in this gallery space. 
And they were like, well, my grandparents don't speak English or my parents don't have a car. And this gallery space was over on the other side of town, so it made it really difficult for them to attend. So unfortunately, none of the youth came, um, but these are obstacles and, and learning things that I'm learning. And so hopefully next year, um, it'll be someplace closer. Uh, in July, we, Eric Parra, who's an SF-based artist, we worked with the Old First Ward Community Center. And they're a neighborhood that really gets overlooked because it's a white community. But they, I really hate using the word poor because I feel like that has so many negative connotations to it. And like my mother would always call us poor. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like we have family, we have our lives, like we have our health, like we have our family and our friends. Like I feel rich, you know? So let's think about the semantics of this world and come up with some, some new language. Um, in any case, we were there for a couple of weeks. We did these free workshops with the youth during the summer. And uh, Eric and I designed the structure that we built out of um, pallets that were donated from uh, a local um, warehouse down the street. And we designed, with the kids' help, the inside and outside of this um, structure that was built for the City of Night Festival. And the kids helped us with the installation. Um, as you can see in the picture on the left, um, the, these were drawings that the kids made in the workshop, and then I had um, Xeroxed them so the kids could take home the original artwork, uh, but then their work would have like another life to it. And in the right, there's um, Eric and a youth that are painting the facade of the structure. And here are some final examples of the work. And it was really wonderful because this piece was right in the community. So during City of Night, the youth brought their families, you know, their parents, their grandparents, their friends. They were walking up and being like, oh, so-and-so made that piece. And it was just, it was a really beautiful experience. And then there's like, you know, the rest of the city of Buffalo coming to this neighborhood that, you know, they may not have been exposed to before. So um, I felt like there was a really great cross-pollination and dialogue from, um, the city of night being in the old first ward. And then the last um, project that I did this year was with Kyla Kegler, who is a Buffalo native, um, but she's been living in Berlin the last six years. And her background is in dance and performance and movement. And we um, did uh, a series of workshops. Um, and then had a final performance that was open to the public that had different stations that people could interact with or if they didn't want to, they could just sit in the pews and observe everything that was going on. And, and that was wonderful to be able to utilize this space. It was in the Richmond Ferry Church, um, which is uh, being currently, it's probably, as you can tell, it, it needs some repair. It's uh, under renovation and it's gonna be opening up in like a year or two as a, um, a performance and dance nonprofit. So it was really wonderful to activate this sort of dead space that wasn't necessarily open to the public that we got access to um, and just sort of like bring it alive and just to give it more life. It was a really wonderful experience. Um, so that's pretty much the end of my talk. Um, I just put together some slides because I think it's important that um, I can't do this alone, and I am not rich. I don't come from a wealthy family. You know, I moved here with nothing. I'm lucky to, you know, have found part-time employment. And but if it wasn't for the people that live locally, that's on these slides, like I, you know, wouldn't have been able to execute these programs. And um, you know, something maybe a question will come up. You know, is the life of an artist? You know. I, I, and or curator, like I'm, I'm both, you know, I'm an artist curator. But it's, it's really difficult because unfortunately the arts aren't well funded in the States and I know overseas in other countries their arts funding is, you know, being cut and, you know, it's like how do we make the best in most of our ideas but not live on welfare and, um, and not feel so impoverished and tight and stressed and, you know, and depressed because, you know, those negative feelings can really, 
you know, infringe on, on your life and, and your mind and, and your ability to be creative? Um, so that's a question that is, we don't need to answer, but I just want to pose that to you. Um, <clears throat> but all of these, I mean, I've had other supporters from the West Coast, um, but I felt like it was important that I share um, these names with you of the people locally that have uh, donated to Project Grant. So um, do you guys have some questions for me? Because I'd like to maybe take the next few minutes and um, collect them. Oh, will you um, hold it in half so it doesn't get stuck? I'm going to grab it out of the It's going to be all choice, random. OK. Do you have a question? 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 No? Does anyone else have a question? Come on. Don't be so shy. I won't know who. Question. Question. What's that? Any questions back here? No? God, I'm so disappointed in you. <laughs> Anyone else? Any other questions? Amanda, are you writing one? Well, here, I may never even, I might not even pick it, so. Or it may be the first one, who knows? All right. This is appropriately called the wild card. Um, all right. This person has a, a very nice uh, design on the outside. Uh, so the question is, the future of Project Grant, question mark. <laughs> That's a very good question. There's a crazy light in my eye. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, I am in the process of kind of reviewing the pros and cons and the strengths and you know weaknesses um, of this first year and in the process of writing several grants and fellowships. And um, I, I can't give you a definite of what's going to happen next year, but I will tell you that something is going to happen. Um, I would like to keep the social um, practice element, um, but I also, um, one thing I didn't talk about um, because she didn't, because as a, I guess maybe I should have specified, as a resident of Project Grant, so all of those artists that I, you know, talked about their projects, they received a stipend from me because I feel like it's important to pay artists, you know, their worth. And unfortunately this year I wasn't necessarily to pay in my mind what I would like to have paid them, but I paid them something for their time. And I also provided them with free room and board, uh, washer dryer, access to the internet. They didn't have to, you know, worry about electricity bills. They had access to a bicycle. They had access to me, 24/7. My car. If they had a driver's license, I would let them use it. Um, I don't know of any other project quite like this in the country. Um, and. It would be really great if I can make this sustainable and offer more artists opportunities next year. Um, but in saying that, like uh, not just the social practice aspect, but I had this one artist that I had worked with in the past who um, came from London to Buffalo for two weeks, and we did a performance at BT and C Gallery for Infringement Festival. And I felt really bad about not being able to pay her because the performance we did was amazing and the time that we spent like in talking about art and her meeting people in the community like I, I feel like that's really important no matter where you are like you need to have this you know it's about cross pollination you know like Amanda Broder's here you know Rachel brought her from New York City like that's amazing you know and she's out in the community and giving talks and meeting other artists like um, you can't live in a bubble because change and progress does not happen like that. And so um, being able to bring as many artists as I can to Buffalo to engage with the community, like, that's my goal. So I would say that would be the answer to that one. All right, is there anything juicy in here? 
<laughs> uh, what's your definition of the word curator? <laughs> well, let's see. I, I could grab my phone because I usually like using the uh, good old internet for definitions. But um, uh, God, that's so dry. I'm not going to pick on you, whoever this is, but it's a good question. Um, so my definition of curator. Um, well, you know, I think I kind of talked about it in the beginning. Oh, my God, Amanda, is this yours? OK, good. <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> um, you, yeah, you know, I think that we'll all have like different definitions, and I, and I think that's important. And um, you know, my background is as an artist. Like in grad school, I did take classes, you know, and I worked with you know, two prominent curators from SFMOMA, but um, the sort of academic and theoretical side, I mean, those are things that I'm contemplating, but I, I think that I make different choices than other people that kind of go to school for, you know, studying the history of art and and then, you know, curatorial practice and such. And, um, and so I kind of have a different outlook on it. And, and for me, as a, as a curator, I, I kind of view it more as being a collaborator. Like even when I was running a wee art space, like all of the shows that happen in my space, it wasn't just the artist has this idea and then here it is on the walls. It's like, no, like, let's talk about this. Like, how can we push your work to new levels and have it really activate and engage the space and the people coming through the space? You know, it's not, I don't believe in the, I've got some paintings, let's hang them on a wall and call it a day. You know, like, I just don't come from that school. And, um, and uh, because I, I feel like there's so much more that you can do with work, you know, even if it is paintings, like just, you know, thinking about the, the possibilities and, and asking questions, I think, is really important. So I hope that answers that. Okay, I'll take like maybe just a couple more here. Okay, how does one manage being an artist and making a living as an artist, creating and living well balanced? Oh my gosh, um, let's ask God. <laughs> I'm totally kidding, I, I don't believe in God, but um, uh, you know, I, I struggle every day on this. So um, I haven't even talked about like my jobs, like I, and the program coordinator at Squeaky Wheel. And it's an amazing organization. And if you haven't seen, we have this, um, I've got some cards up here, but um, I was able to work with Nal Bustamante, who's an internationally known artist, and she has her solo exhibit that opened in Los Angeles, and it's doing its East Coast debut here in Buffalo. And that was an amazing experience, being able to work with her. Um, and, but it's only part time. Do you even know what part-time means? Like 20 hours a week. There's no benefits. <laughs> so what have I been doing? I have been writing for the public. I've been, I've had two restaurant slash bar jobs, you know, and, um, and it's been a struggle, you know, and I've been fortunate to have people support me through Project Grant because it's fiscally sponsored, so you know, I can accept tax donations like a 501c3. Um, I can apply for grants, which is wonderful, but it's um, it's really hard. And, you know, the bar job pays for me to pay my bills, but also to get acupuncture to help with the stress, <laughs> you know? And, um, but, you know, this room, I have friends here, and that also helps having, you know, a good network and support and, you know, knowing that you're not alone and that what you're doing is for something greater. You know, I'm, I, I, I can't remember who said it, but, you know, if you go into the art world, you know, thinking that you're going to be, you know, famous and or rich, like you're barking up the wrong tree, you know, it's, it's about something more than that. So, um, you know, that question is something that I continually ask myself to try and figure out, like, how can I be sustainable? And, you know, it's something in terms of the next few months as I'm applying for grants and, and re-examining the project that I'm, you know, taking into, um, you know, into account. Because um, you, 
we should all try and be happy. Like that should be whatever that means, you know. Like that should be the first and, and foremost um, thing that that we that we do here, you know. And then um, and then if there's things that aren't making you happy and they're making you miserable, then you should think about eliminate them from your life because um, you potentially only have one life, and um, you know we really need to make the most of it. So. Um, how are you guys feeling? Should we do more questions, or was that like a good end right there? Does anyone have a dire question that if I don't answer it, Charlie? Oh, <laughs> um, so my performance work involves the body, um, usually in risque, controversial situations, um, dealing with class and race and and sex. And um, Liv Fontaine, my library, and I, we came up with this piece titled You Don't Own Me. And so it, I'll just kind of describe the setting to you. Uh, so it started off uh, for the first half hour as people were getting there. We were sort of dressed in like business attire, uh, short black skirts, you know, white button up, you know, long sleeve collared shirts and we had makeup on and our hair done and black high heels and, and then like we um, kind of escaped to the back and then uh, Anna, uh, ushered everyone into the gallery space, space and closed the door. And then we came out in these worker outfits, kind of like the industrial or like mechanics, you know, like denim, button up. Um, we still had, had our high heels on and, um, and we asked the audience to divide based on their sex. So the men were to come forward and the women were to go to the back of the room. And from there, we, um, we had this table set up up in the corner for the women. And it was bottles of champagne, those little plastic champagne cups, and some strawberries. And we told the women to go and have a drink and relax. There were some chairs, like, go and hang out. And with the men, they had to do a bunch of work. Um, Matt's in the audience. Matt was there. Uh, First of all, we um, kind of reiterated that men don't follow directions very well. And um, we'd given explicit directions about what we wanted. And we had, um, Liv and I had put X's on the ground that were in the shape of a cross. And we wanted, we had given them some black tape and we wanted them to outline the cross. But in not crossing each mark more than once, if you know that makes sense. So they were just supposed to do the outline. But instead they took the shortcut and they're like, shh, 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 shh. You know, and I was like, all right, it's done. Let's move on, you know. And uh, so then we, we had the men uh, sit down on the cross and Liv and I went around and we first tied their hands behind their back and then we um, blindfolded each of the men and then we told them to sit there in silence and to have them think, which I think is kind of hard for some people. So some people started fidgeting. And any time a guy tried to get on loose or something, um, we reprimanded the whole group. And they had to sit there for an extra couple minutes. So it, it could have gone on for a lot longer, but I kind of put the hatchet down. I was like, all right. But um, so while the men were doing that, the women were just observing. Some of them went around and, and looked at the men more closely as these objects that were on the ground. And, um, and then when we felt like the time was right, we um, uh, unblindfolded the men and untied their hands. And we asked everyone to stand up and gather into the center of the space. And Liv's work um, also deals with the same issues of, that I deal with, um, but in a much more kind of vulgar manner. She uses, um, I use text, but she usually does these sort of like very vocal um, animated um, pieces. And she had come up with this writing that was about how sexism in the world, or at least, okay, I'll finish my thought then backtrack, um, how, as a woman, how she feels, you know, integrated in a world with men and women, and the roles that we're like placed into, um, through the lens of a female artist. Um, and then, as she was doing that, um, I um, undressed myself and stood um, nude in front of the crowd, 
And then we took off our high heels and we walked off the um, gallery floor into the back and the piece ended. So that was the piece. Um, but a question that had come up about that was um, uh, someone asked if we would have done that piece somewhere else and I said it would depend. Um, one of the things that I've become aware of in Buffalo is um, the, the there is still, uh, sexism and racism are still pretty prevalent here in Buffalo. And um, so this piece was made specifically for Buffalo. Like I would, we wouldn't have done that piece in San Francisco. It would have been about something else, you know? So, um, so. You're welcome. Anything else? Yes, Bob? Okay, um, let me do the latter first. Netflix, because <laughs> you need to figure out a way to how to save money, right? So, um, so Netflix is a really great form of entertainment and education because they've got really great documentaries on there and TV shows that are based about history and um, and it's seven ninety nine a month. Like you know, you can't go to the movie theater and spend you know that little um, and. Uh, Another sort of on that line and maybe practical is really figure out how much money you make because the thing is when I first moved to Buffalo and I was working at Squeaky, um, I was on food stamps and I have no problem saying that. I mean, I was on food stamps when I was in grad school. Like, it's a resource that's out there. And you know those performative dinners I, I was talking about? How do you think those people ate so luxuriously? It wasn't because I was paying for it, the state was paying for it actually. Um, and I got on Medicaid for health insurance, and so free dental, free eye. I mean, th those are things that I think people just automatically think, oh, they're not for me, and I don't want to take advantage of them, but I feel like you have to be realistic in the, in the state in which you're operating, and I have no problems, like, seeking help, you know, in those avenues, because they're there, you know? Um, and so, and then from the other side, you know, just maybe programmic, pro, uh, I can't even say the word right now, programmically, um, is, uh, and I'm still not saying it right, um, is, uh, you know, collaboration is really important and having community partners um, and talking to your friends, networking, you know, going to different events where there's like-minded people um, and just really kind of increase, you know, your, your, you know, your bounty of, you know, who you know, because you don't know everything and you don't have the right answers, but there are other people out there that could be really great resources. And, you know, until you open your mouth and you start asking questions like you, you don't know. Um, and so um, it's, you know, and Buffalo's great for that. Like there's a really supportive network here. And so just, you know, talking and meeting and asking questions and, I'm trying to think. Um, you know, there's in other cities, there's like really great places like specific nonprofits like Compass Point that have, um, you know, different services, um, access to um, library information for grants and workshops and things like that. And um, I think ASI is one good resource in terms of the arts. Like they have different professional development workshops and things that are either free or low cost, um, so you can check them out. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, anything else? All right, well, thank you guys very much for joining me this evening. It's been a pleasure.